started, I'd like to shamelessly plug my 2021 workshops. In a, fisture, in, a, in a gesture of grand optimism, hopefully not foolish optimism, I am gonna offer some uh, in-person landscape photography courses in 2021. Uh, the first one won't be till the end of April. It'll be called Moab in Spring, obviously down in Moab. Uh, then I'm offering two workshops in Rocky Mountain National Park, which I'm calling Sunsets and Stars in Rocky Mountain National Park. And those are gonna be a deep dive into Milky Way photography. Uh, three days, I'm calling it a master class in Milky Way photography. Uh, it'll sharpen everybody's planning, shooting, and processing skills. Uh, offering a workshop in the San Juans in late September, a fall color workshop, and then sunsets and stars in Canyonlands, which will again be a Milky Way masterclass uh, where we'll be shooting, you know, two nights of shooting and uh, a lot of information on planning, processing, and uh, and actually shooting. So if you're interested. Um, you can go to the website Ellen mentioned is at glenrandall.com with two N's in Glen. So with that preamble, let's get started here. So uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, and let's go to Lightroom. And let's see here. Screen. Okay, I am going to hide the video panel so I can see um, so, so I cannot see you anymore, but I can certainly hear you. So please feel free to interrupt with questions. Um, this way, your the video panel doesn't overlap the controls in Lightroom. So panoramas. The easiest way to shoot a panorama is, of course, to just take a single frame and crop it. But that has two big disadvantages. One is that you are limited in angle of view to the angle of view of your widest lens. And two, uh, you are limited in resolution to the resolution of a single frame. So uh, if you want to create you know, images with massive resolution, or if you want to go wider or taller than a single frame will allow, it's a great new tool in your arsenal to learn how to shoot stitched panoramas. So I'm going to start here with a little bit of eye candy, hopefully get everybody inspired by uh, the possibilities here of, of uh, learning this kind of uh, learning these techniques. Then I'm going to switch to a different webcam and I'm going to show you the hardware. And we're going to start with, let's say you just want to dabble in this and you don't want to buy anything new. You want to use the existing hardware that you have. What can you do? And the answer is a lot. Um, and then what can you not do? Where are the limitations? Uh, if you want to start building a panorama kit, what should you buy first, then second, then third, etc. So uh, this may look like a single frame. It was actually multiple frames with a 16 millimeter lens set vertically. You know, when auroras are good, they just absolutely fill the sky. Panorama from of the Needles District, Canyonlands, from the top of this uh, sandstone tower I scrambled up. 180 degree panorama of Aspen at Sunrise. This is near the uh, uh, Mount Elbert, South Mount Elbert Trailhead. Uh, Dead Horse Point, kind of a glow shot just after sunset when that glow to the west is filling the canyon with that maw of light. Uh, 180 degree panorama of Lupin at sunrise. You can see obviously the sun's in the frame, so that's dead on backlit, and then those mountains are basically frontlit, so it tells you it's 180 degree panorama. This may look like a single frame. It was actually two rows of three with a 16 millimeter lens. Gives you an idea of just how steeply I was looking down into this canyon and how steeply I was looking up to include the whole Milky Way. Uh, this is Brimhall Point, Mays District, uh, west side of Canyonlands National Park. A 360 degree panorama of moonset at sunrise from the summit of North Maroon, which is uh, one of the 14ers near Aspen. Another glow shot in the Needles District, Canyonlands, so just before dawn. Kebler Pass, Aspen Panorama, uh, there on the, to the west of Crested Butte. Chesler Park, again in the Needles District. A 360 degree panorama of uh, wildflowers and meadow mountain at sunset. I think I've only seen the sky light up in every direction on maybe one or two occasions. This is the first time I'd ever tried to shoot a 360 degree panorama of wildflowers. And I was incredibly lucky to get this sky. Just, you just don't get that lucky very often. 
I had scouted this location the previous year and thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool to shoot this, the head of Squaw Canyon here in the Needles District when the sun was coming up right through that gap. So I'd have warm light on my, sun, on my uh, foreground. So I shot a compass bearing to that gap, wrote it down, came home, figured out when that would happen, and then came back the following year and made sure I was there at sunrise. Panorama from the summit of Quandry Peak in January. A Milky Way panorama over uh, the Maze District in Canyonland. So basically, anytime you see a full Milky Way panorama stretching from horizon to horizon, that has to be a stitched panorama. You know, even with like a 14 millimeter lens, which has a 104 degree angle of view, it's still not wide enough to really capture that full arc. Monument Basin you know, on a cold December night. Clearing storm, just a snow squall had rolled through a few minutes earlier. Panorama from the summit of Snowmass Mountain on a morning when I probably should not have been there. Milky Way panorama over Chesler Park, back in the Needles District. Timberline Pass and Longs Peak. And a Milky Way panorama over Elephant Canyon. So I shot this with a 35 millimeter F14 lens. It was two rows, three rows, excuse me, three rows, nine camera positions per row. Um, and this will print seven feet wide at 240 pixels per inch. So incredible detail as well as low noise. The classic Bear Lake panorama, Longs Peak to Hallett Peak on an amazingly calm morning. Turk's Head and the Green River in the Island in the Sky District in Canyonlands. Milky Way panorama over Turret Arch and uh, South Window. You can see through both arches simultaneously from this location. A 360 degree panorama of moon rise at sun Sorry, it's moon set at sunrise from the summit of Sunlight Peak. <laughs> the Black Canyon of the Gunnison with some very strange clouds. Goblin Valley State Park, which is uh, south of uh, Green River, reputed to be one of the darkest places on the planet. Um, the Black Canyon again with the chasm view on the left and the painted wall on the right from aptly named exclamation point. Sunrise from the summit of Capitol Peak, reputedly the hardest peak in Colorado, although I think that's a bit of a myth. And Silver Jack Reservoir area and the, uh, the uh, Cimarrons from uh, an overlook along the Alpine Trail. Milky Way panorama over Capitol Peak. First time I have ever snowshoed in June and first time I've ever snowshoed in shorts. This was like June 3rd um, after a really heavy snow year. Fisher Towers near Moab, another great dark sky location. Milky Way panorama from the summit of Huron Peak. Four rows, 10 frames per row with a 50 millimeter F14. And a 360 degree panorama of moonrise at sunset from the summit of Mount Eolus, which is back down in the Needle Mountains, San Juans. The Milky Way panorama a shot everybody seems to want, Milky Way over Mesa Arch. I understand that it's so popular now that two o'clock in the morning, there are tour buses pulling into the parking lot and disgorging hordes of photographers. If it's really as crowded as, as I have been told, I can't imagine anybody can actually get a decent shot. There just be too many lights going on and off. Milky Way panorama over Long's Peak in early April, right after the last big snow of the year. And this is shot from the uh, Sneffels Range Overlook, which is obviously near in the Sneffels Range. Um, I didn't even know this overlook existed until I saw it on a map that I bought in Ure. The Ure Hiking Club basically puts out this really cool map 
and, and I'd never heard of this place before. So I scouted it last summer, uh, thought, wow, there, you know, I'm at 11,000 feet and I still have Aspen in my foreground, came back in the fall and I uh, camped about a quarter mile away, shot two sunrises and two sunsets here. And this was by far the most interesting shoot. I, one thing I wanted to point out here is this was actually shot with a 16 millimeter lens pointing down about 20 degrees. Uh, so re remember that when we get around to discussing the hardware necessary to shoot this kind of thing. And one final shot. Uh, this may not look like a panorama. It actually is one row with a 35 millimeter F14 for the land and then two rows for the background sky again with a 35 F14. And then I put two 24 millimeter F14 lenses side by side with their field of view just overlapping slightly and shot 2,700 frames for the meteors, just basically 10 hours of running those cameras back to back, just frame after frame back to back all night long. Uh, it was something like 900 miles of driving, three days of processing and 2,700 frames to wade through to find all the bright meteors. Uh, so this is the Geminid meteor shower over Monument Basin uh, about two years ago now. So. All right, and that is the last of those. Let me go back to, see, let me stop sharing for a second here. All right, so that there's, there's a, hopefully get everybody inspired to, uh, to, to learn a little bit more about panoramas if you haven't already shot them. I, uh, so let's take a look at the hardware. Uh, so let's go to the webcam utility and see if this will work. And the answer is nope, got to cycle the power here. That looks more promising. All right, I'm going to switch, switch cameras here. So let's talk a little bit about what you can do with the equipment you own right now. Don't buy a thing. Just you want to go out and play with this. Here's what you can do. And then here are the limitations. So in order to shoot a panorama that will stitch together reliably, you need to do two things. You need to have the plane of uh, rotation, which is the chassis, right? So I'm rotating down here. This is the plane of rotation. That needs to be level, okay? So if it's not level, this, this is actually a place where a lot of students get confused. They think that all they have to do is level the camera left to right. So they level the camera left to right. Okay, that's pretty close. Good enough for demonstration purposes. I'm gonna make it a little bit more, I'm gonna make it level front to back too, just for fun. So they think that as long as the camera's level, they should be okay. Okay, let me show you why that's not true. So I'm gonna deliberately make that chassis. This is the chassis where the three tripod legs come together. Now I'm gonna re-level the camera. So now I'm pointing right at the middle of my panorama. Camera's nice and level, left to right. And let's see, let's get it about approximately right front to back. Okay, camera's level left to right, front to back. But now see what happens. Oops, now the camera's pointing down. In other words, your skyline will be very high in your frame because you're pointing the camera down. And then you pan across the scene. Now the camera's pointing up. Now the horizon is very low in the frame. Well, you can imagine what that looks like when you stitch it all together. You get this dramatically skewed uh, skyline. So two things must be level in order to reliably stitched together. So let me get it approximately right again, just for demo purposes, close enough. So two things must be level, the plane of rotation and the camera must be level left to right. You do not need to level the camera front to back. In fact, you can actually point the camera down and the stitching software these days is so good that it'll still stitch things together, even though you have keystoning in your trees and stuff like that. It's pretty darn reliable. It is not, however, invincible. <laughs> and usually when I'm giving a pano talk, somebody at some point will pipe up and say, gee, Glenn, I just kind of hand hold it and click, 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 and it works. And my response is always, I'm so glad you didn't blow a once in a lifetime opportunity using sloppy field technique. So I would rather teach you a, a method that I know will stitch 
reliably time after time after time. Okay, so in order to make that chassis level, the only way to do that is to adjust the length of the tripod legs. Maybe not such a big deal if you're standing here on a level carpeted floor, considerably more of a pain in the neck if you are setting up on a tailor slope and in your hurry because the light is fading. Um, but it certainly can be done. If, if you are fortunate, your chassis will have a bubble level. I know you probably can't see it, but there's a bubble level right here. So with this particular tripod, I can just use that bubble level. I adjust the length of the tripod legs till the chassis level. Then I level the camera left to right and I'm good to go. I can point it down as long as it's level left to right or point it up, either one. If you don't have a bubble level in your chassis, one alternative that I've used because my lightweight tripod doesn't have a bubble level is just take the head off temporarily, get one of those little um, hot shoe bubble levels you can get for 30 bucks at B&H. And you just set it on the, on the chassis itself on that platform where the head mounts. And then you adjust the legs, leg length until that chassis is level, is plumb. Um, that's one, that's probably your best solution, you know, depending on your, you, you know, you could possibly do it in other ways as well, but that would, that would be the most reliable solution. Okay, so if you're just shooting, if you're shooting panoramas where everything is 100 feet away or farther, you know, the closest part of your subject is 100 feet away or farther, then that's all you need to do. Because if that's the case, you don't need to worry about parallax. Of course, the most interesting panoramas typically have a close in foreground. Then you need to worry about parallax. Parallax is easy to understand. If you close one eye, put your finger up in front of your face and rotate your head, your finger moves in relation to the background. Same thing happens with a standard tripod head. The optical eye, the optical center of this system is right out here. That's where the eye is but the plane of rotation is back here. Similarly, you know, your eye is not centered on the axis rotation of your head. It's back there somewhere, you know, in the middle of your neck. It's not where your eye is. Your eye is forward of that point. So in order to correct that problem of parallax, you know, the first piece of hardware you'd need to buy is a nodal slide. So let me grab a nodal slide here. Okay, so this is a nodal slide. This happens to be made by Really Right Stuff. There are other companies that make less expensive ones. Um, you need to make sure you get the right length. Um, if you have big zoom lenses like most of us do these days, you'll probably want the longest one that they make. So you put that nodal slide in the clamp and put the camera mounted back here. And now when we uh, pan across the scene, the pivot point, the rotation point is out here. It's no longer back here, it's right here. That's where the camera is pivoting. So you do of course have to find the nodal point for each lens and the elbow bracket you have in the camera and everything. So there's, it is a one-time test and I'll show you how to uh, set it up and check that you've got it right. Um, you don't need to test every millimeter change in focal length on your zoom lens. Uh, this is a 16 to 35. So I tested 16, 20, 24, 28, and 35. That's good enough. Um, you know, the basic idea is that you hang a string, maybe two feet in front of the lens, hang it from some support. I used the roof of my garage with the garage door open. And then you want to be able to look out of the garage, in my case, at a street lamp across the street, and you just play with it. You just pivot back and forth. Oh, I'm still, you know, the string is moving in relation to the street lamp. I'll move it back. I'll move it forward. Guess and check. Eventually you'll find the nodal point where the string does not move in relation to the street lamp as you pan back and forth. That's your nodal point. You write that down, put it on a card, put it in your, um, you, know, you could put it in your uh, camera bag. What I did just for convenience sake is I created a little chart. I printed it out on a big adhesive label, stuck it to the nodal slide itself. And then I put a little peel and stick plastic laminate over it. You can get it Office Depot just to keep, you know, in case a drop of rain got on it or something, it wouldn't immediately smear. Okay, so with those two tools, with this tool, you can do an awful lot. Like you remember I was telling you about that panorama from the Sneffels range 
overlook that big fall panorama. It was the second to last shot. Um, so that's a backpacking trip, you know, and it's a dry camp. So I had to haul all my water in. So obviously weight's very important. Uh, so I wanted to, I didn't want to bring this massive tripod. So I brought a much lighter tripod, brought a nodal slide, and then I was able to, you know, it takes time. I was able to level the chassis um, and I leveled the camera left to right. And then I pointed the camera down with that 16 millimeter lens in order to see those Aspen at the base of the cliff I was standing on top of. Similarly, if you wanted to shoot a Milky Way panorama and you know, that's, it's huge Milky Way panoramas. You could point, you could level the chassis, point the camera up, level it left to right. And you could pan across and shoot your Milky Way panorama without buying any fancy more hardware. So the big disadvantage of this system is just, it's a very tedious setup, particularly if you're in a hurry setting up on uneven ground, it's hard to get that chassis level, it's a pain. So like all problems in photography, you can solve the problem beautifully if you're willing to throw enough money at it. So I threw more money at it. This is what's called a panning clamp. It's again, made by really right stuff. Um, there are probably companies that make, that also make it. Um, you still need the nodal slide. So put that on there. So let's say I'm just setting that at the nodal point. And then the camera goes back here as before. But before I do that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, there's a big bubble level. You can't quite see it. There's a big bubble level right here. I am going to level the panning clamp using that bubble level, close enough for demonstration purposes. And now I'm gonna lock down the main tripod head controls because I'm not gonna touch them again. Instead, I'm gonna pan up here. Doesn't matter if this is level anymore because I'm not moving this anymore. This is level and that's where I'm panning. So it dramatically speeds up setup because you just, you know, you've got one, you know, you just throw it on, you got one bubble level to adjust and you're done. The, can't, the plane of rotation is level left to right and the camera is level left to right. So you've met the, that two criteria and you've got the nodal slide so you can shoot with close in foregrounds. The disadvantage of this is that you're also level front to back. So in a situation like there at the Sneffels Range Overlook where I wanted, I had to point the camera down, even with my widest lens, I was still not looking down steeply enough into that valley. So what I did there was I just took the panning clamp out of the system, leveled the chassis, leveled the camera left to right, pointed it down and made the shot. But this is, you know, uh, very, very fast. Um, and usually when you're shooting panoramas, particularly if you have a wide angle zoom, you know, you just, you, you may have way too much sky or way too much land in your composition, but who cares? It's a stitched panorama. You still have awesome resolution. You just crop off the extra sky or crop off the extra land and, and don't worry about it. Um, so a couple other tips on composing panoramas. You might think that you are stitching together a bunch of rectangles and are therefore going to get a rectangular image, just a big wide rectangular image. You don't. What you get is an image that has scallops and I'll show that to you as well. So it's got all these scalloped edges, which you will want to crop away. Yes, Lightroom offers some tools for filling in those edges, either using boundary warp or using you know, fill edges. Um, but in one case, it's, it's warping the image to take out those scallops. In another, it's inventing pixels to fill in those edges. Sure, in a pinch, it's a great tool. <laughs> It's better to just compose generously, include more on the left and on the right and on the top and on the bottom than you will want in the final composition, recognizing that you are going to lose some of what you see through the viewfinder. So compose generously. Um, you do not butt the frames up side by side. They must overlap. You want about a 30% overlap. It does not need to be precise, but 25, 30% is fine. Um, the way the software works is it identifies common points in the overlapping regions of adjacent images. So for example, you have Long's Peak in the left side of one frame and in the right side of another frame. Um, you know, the software will say, ah, that summit cairn on Long's Peak has to match up with the summit cairn on Long's Peak in the adjacent frame. And it'll make those two points match. Then it finds other points to match up, does its warping and twisting magic and 
stitches everything together for you. Um, it's very helpful, particularly at night, to not be sort of trying to eyeball the amount of rotation as you're panning across the scene. So you can look through the camera, identify some point at the far right side of the scene, and then pan till it's about one third of the way in from the left side of the scene. Take the next picture, identify something on the far right side of the frame, pan till it's one third of the way in, etc. But that's tedious, it's easy to make mistakes. Uh, at night, it's very difficult because you can't see through the lens very well. So one of the things that I did was simply to calculate the number of degrees of pan for my the focal length lenses that I use. Uh, so what I did is, you know, photo pills or any number of websites have angle of view calculators, you know, you put in your lens, you tell it whether it's full frame or subframe. Um, it'll tell you the angle of view of the lens on the short dimension because I always shoot vertically to get more resolution. So for example, with a 35 millimeter lens, the uh, angle of view on the short dimension is 38 degrees. I took about two thirds of that, rounded to the nearest five degrees, 25 degrees is my pan angle. The other thing I do is that, at least on really right stuff gear, there is a degree scale down here. And then there's of course a zero point and then there's a really right stuff logo right here. So I set that on the zero point um, and I always start on the far, you know, with the far left side as my first frame. And then it's very easy to know how to calculate each successive position of the camera as I pan across. So 35 millimeter lens, 25 degree pan angle, zero, 25, 50, 75, 100, all the way across. Um, don't need to look through the camera. I know I've got it right. I know I have enough overlap. It's very fast, lights changing, stars are moving can't see through the lens anyhow at night. So that, that's really the, the best way to do it. Um, exposure, uh, you want everything on manual. You want manual exposure, manual white balance, manual ISO, manual focus. You don't want anything changing as you pan across that scene. No polarizers. You don't want a polarizer either. Uh, some people think, well, gee, you know, don't I want to get the right exposure at each camera position? Well. No, you want the same exposure at every camera position. Hopefully you can find a compromise exposure that will be correct all the way across the scene. If it's a moderate contrast panorama, maybe it's soft light, maybe you're looking away from the sun, that could work. Most panoramas, of course, are going to be high contrast, at least most of the most interesting ones. Uh, the easiest way by far to deal with exposure in a, uh, for panoramas in a high contrast situation is to use HDR techniques. So at a minimum, do three frame bracket set, two stop bracket interval. Run through your first sequence of you know panorama sequence, then look at the histogram for every single frame in that whole sequence. Make sure that for the most contrasty part of the scene, the very darkest frame has good highlight detail, the very lightest frame has good shadow detail. The easiest way, if it turns out it's so high contrast that that's not working, the easiest solution is to do a five frame bracket set, two stop bracket interval. But I wouldn't resort to that always because that plus four stop exposure could eat up a lot of time. Clouds can move, things can change, light changes. So ideally you would find a bracket set, three frame bracket set, two stop bracket interval that would give you rich detail in the highlights and the shadows uh, with one of those frames from the bracket set. That is basically the single frame, single row, excuse me, hardware. Let's take a quick look at um, what multi-row hardware looks like. So why would you want to ever shoot, why would you ever want to shoot a multiple row panorama? Well, two reasons. One is incredible resolution. I got an assignment once from a company that made very high end uh, hunting rifles. The most, uh, most, their ex most expensive model weighed or cost, excuse me, $25,000 for this hunting rifle. Okay. Um, and they wanted a trade show booth poster that would be 10 feet by 10 feet at 300 pixels per inch. In other words, they wanted an image that was 36,000 pixels on both dimensions. So I shot it for them. 
with multi-row panorama hardware, 200 millimeter lens. It was 108 frames, nine rows of 13 images per row. You know, the file size, like, you know, five gigabytes or something like that, but it met the, <laughs> the criteria. So this is what you need if you want to shoot multi-row panoramas. The other reason you might want those, uh, a multi-row kit, is for situations like that one at the Sneffels Range Overlook, where I want to be able to set up quickly. I want to be able to uh, be able to point the camera down, but I want to do multiple rows. In that case, I didn't need them there, but in that in that case, I just wanted to point down without having to mess with leveling the chassis. Um, or if you want to do multiple rows, like most of those Milky Way panoramas are multi-row. So we're going to make really right stuff even richer. They don't make this exact um, hardware configuration anymore. Um, they they changed it, which personally I think was a mistake. I think that they went backwards, not forwards when they changed it, but it's it's still workable. It's still very solidly made, of course. Okay, so you still need the nodal slide. And you put the camera in very, very carefully because if you don't get that clamp right, you'll drop your camera on the ground. So nice and solid. Okay, so now there's a big bubble level here. I can level that, which levels this, which levels this. Now, you know, the camera is now level left to right and it's panning up here again. We're not panning down here. We lock down these controls and we don't touch them because I'm panning up here, but now I can point the lens down. So I can pan across, you know, shoot my first row, move it up, shoot my second row, move it up, shoot my third row, etc. You know, the pitch angle, which is the amount of change in that vertical plane. Um, again, two thirds of the angle of view of the lens on the long dimension. I think you'll find as a practical matter, you rarely need to change the pitch that much, but you could move it that far. Um, okay, so that is hardware. Um, I realize all of you are muted, but are there any questions about what we've covered so far? If you want to demute temporarily, press the space bar, press and hold space bar. Any questions? Do you have a book that explains all this? Uh, yes, the, there is um, a discussion of panoramas in the second edition of the Art, Science and Craft of Great Landscape Photography. So that would be one, one good resource. Which, by the way, I just put in the chat. Oh, thank you. So, um, so, so check check that out, Owen. It's um, it's the book I was holding up at the start, also. So, excellent. Yeah. Other questions about the hardware uh, before we get to finding the nodal point, things like that. Just questions about the hardware, exposure, setup in the field. Any other questions? Okay. So let me switch back to the other, uh, the integrated webcam and let me share my screen again. And let's take a look at this problem of parallax. All right, so let me first show you what happens if you don't have a nodal slide and you have some complex geometric shape like this light stand and tripod that's about three feet away from your camera. So this is the left frame of a two frame panorama. So it's just a single single shot here, not, not a panorama now. There's the left side and there's the right side. Just panned across, very simple. And then I stitched them together and this is what I got. You know, large chunks of uh, tripod legs are dislocated or disappeared or whatever. Um, so clearly, you know, if, if something is three feet away, you absolutely need a nodal slide. What I did was I shot six trials at a, a variety of distances. I had to go all the way out to 100 feet away where the closest part of the subject was 100 feet away before I got zero errors out of six trials. Okay, so let's talk about finding the nodal point. So here's just some shots through the camera 
there's that string that I was talking about hanging about two feet in front of the lens. And there's a street lamp on the far side of the street. And in this particular pair of images, I did not find the nodal point. So you can see the string is to the right of the street lamp. And then I pan across the scene and oh darn, now the string is to the left of the street lamp. Clearly I have not found the nodal point. Um, so if I tried to stitch these two frames together, where should Lightroom put that string, you know, left of the street lamp or right of the street lamp? You know, you've just thrown Lightroom a huge curveball, and many times it's just going to strike out. Okay, now I move that nodal slide forward and backward, forward and backward until the string doesn't move in relation to the street lamp as I pan across the scene. So now the string is just barely left of the street lamp. I pan across the scene. It's still just barely left of the street lamp. Uh, so I found the nodal point. There's a millimeter scale along the nodal slide. I write that down, 16 millimeter lens. I need 21 millimeters on the nodal scale. I write that down, stick it in my camera bag or on the, on the nodal slide itself. And you do this once at home. You don't need to do that. You never do this in the field. You just do it once at home and write down the numbers and then it will can be consistent as long as you have the same camera body, same lens, same L bracket on your camera, you know, et cetera. All right, so let's take a look at the, the software procedure, which if you've done your job well in the field, the software procedure is pretty trivial. So this is a bracketed set, three frame bracket set, two stop bracket interval of a 180 degree panorama of moonset at sunrise from the summit of Wyndham Peak. So here, just to show you guys what we're looking at briefly. So here we have the metered minus two, plus two, metered, minus two, plus two, et cetera, all the way across the whole scene. So the software procedure is really quite simple. I'm just going to select all the images. I'm going to right click on one of them. I'm gonna to go to photo merge, HDR panorama. So if you don't, if you're still using one of the, uh, you know, perpetual license versions of Lightroom, you won't have this feature, but if you're using uh, the, um, the subscription model, you know, then you will have this feature. So it's now called Lightroom LRC, you know, Lightroom Classic. So I'll just click HDR Panorama and we'll have to wait just a moment while it grinds. While it does, let me show you a couple of other things here. So your main question here is, you know, to select a projection. So basically, you know, you're going to create a flat image but if you choose spherical, it will project the image as if it was on the inside of a sphere and then it'll flatten it out. If you choose cylindrical, it'll project the image as if it was on the inside of a cylinder and then it'll flatten it out. So let me show you what that will look like. Generally, I find that single row panoramas, particularly with moderate wide angle lenses or longer, cylindrical is usually your best bet. Um, if you're using a very wide lens or if you're doing a very wide lens and pointing it radically up or down, or if you're doing multiple rows, then spherical is probably your best bet. But, you know, you can just try both solutions um, and just see which one you like best. What I think you'll find is cylindrical tends to stretch everything vertically a little bit. So watch what happens when I choose spherical. The whole thing will collapse vertically. It'll be, it'll be compressed in the vertical dimension. So I choose spherical. And it's going to build a preview. There we are. See how it kind of flattened out? So we'll go back to cylindrical. It kind of stretches vertically. Spherical compresses down. So generally for single row, you know, I like my mountains to look tall. So I usually choose that. As you can see, we have scalloped edges. Um, so you can use boundary warp, the boundary warp slider and it'll fill in those edges for you, but it does have to warp things to do that. Um, you can also choose fill edges. It'll build a preview. Actually, this might take it a minute. Um, it will just fill in, it'll invent pixels and fill in those scallops. I think actually we don't really wanna do that. So I'm gonna turn that off because um, it, it would take too long. Um, auto crop just would crop off the scallops automatically, but it's non-destructive. You can change that. Personally, I leave that unchecked and I prefer to do my editing myself um, so I don't do not check auto settings and I don't check create stack because I just have a different way of organizing my panoramas. So I'm going to cancel that for a second and just show you what, 
what the result is. So this is what it looked like when it came out of the uh, stitching program after a little bit of editing. Um, you know, the great beauty of this system in Lightroom is that, you know, you're starting with raw files. So Lightroom will stitch together each bracketed set and output an image that is still a raw file. It's just an HDR raw file. Then it'll stitch together all those HDR files and it's still an HDR file. It's still a raw HDR file, meaning it still has all the editing flexibility that um, you would expect from a raw file. So questions, questions about the hardware, software, anybody? Really right stuff has got to love you. They do, they do. <laughs> I've spent a lot of money there. No, there, there are less expensive alternatives for sure. And maybe you can find some stuff used, you know, it's so well built that if you could find it used and people haven't left it out in the rain, um, you know, it, it'd probably last forever. You know, I had a student who said to me once, you know, unless you're you, you'll never wear this stuff out. And I said, well, I'm not me either. And I'll never wear it out either. I mean, my grandkids are going to inherit this stuff here someday, <laughs> so. Yeah, but it's sure great stuff. No question about it. Yes, it's very well made. It's a joy to use. Um, it's just a pleasure working with such a precise piece of hardware. So yeah, I, I, I certainly recommend it for the quality, Ed, and I, but I recognize it's expensive. Um, other questions? Yes, can you use that for multiple roles in Lightroom? Y yeah, Lightroom's stitching software is now very good. And yes, I have used it for multiple rows. Uh, and it seems to work well. I mean, I will say that every stitching program I've ever used has failed at one point or another with a particular set of images, but I've never had all three of my high-end stitching programs fail on the same set of images. I've always found a way at some point to stitch them together. Um, that's assuming I did my job right. I would recommend, I don't know how many of you have tilt shift lenses, I would recommend you do not use them for panoramas because that's you know, one of the ways that the software knows how to warp and stitch all this stuff together is it knows the geometric distortion inherent in the lens because it knows the manufacturer. And there's, there's actually, you know, I think Adobe must do tests to see uh, what that geometric distortion is. And once you start moving that lens off axis, which is what you're doing when you're using a tilt shift lens, then all bets are off. And the software, in my experience, has a really hard time with that. Um, so, you know, just use, a, use straight lenses. Don't use tilt shifts. For your panoramas. Um, so does uh, Photoshop do a better job of stitching than Lightroom still or or is Lightroom now on parity? I would say Lightroom's on parity, uh, although I haven't rigorously compared them. I would assume that it's the same processing engine in both of them uh, at this point. For a while, Photoshop would not really handle any kind of multi-row and Lightroom came out and was better, but I imagine Photoshop is caught up. Other questions? Are you also focus stacking in any of those pictures? I have not. I don't believe I've ever done any focus stacked panorama. No, I've just used, uh, you know, hyperfocal distance to get acceptable sharpness. Um, right at the beginning, when you when you're selecting your your three or four or five photos that you're going to merge, you right click to get photo merge. Where, where does the photo merge come in in Lightroom? Yeah, so you, you select all the images, right no. click and choose okay. photo merge panorama if it's and just HDR. single frames or photo merge HDR panorama. Okay. Yeah, I imagine you can also get that from the photo menu, you know, in the top main menu bar. Yeah, I, I, I tried that once and I didn't, I didn't see it right away. That's ah, okay. Yeah, there's a lot of choices there. And yeah, and, there's a lot there. Yeah, there is. There is. Other questions? All right. Well, thank you all very much for your attention and uh, good luck with your photography. So it's interesting.